And so a brief reflection on God's word together, and then uh, an opportunity for uh, me, for uh, Clarion, uh, to be recommissioned for whatever God leads us to in the future. The Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans. Uh, it is at times incredibly carefully woven argument. And towards the end, it becomes a little bit more practical and easy to understand. Uh, you can't write the book of Romans without having the brain of a small planet. Uh, it is just incredibly carefully constructed and brilliantly written. And so the practical bits at the end are actually easier for us to grasp. I want to make just two very simple observations from the passage Phil read to us. It encapsulates part of my personal passion, but I believe it's a gospel imperative to understand what this passage says. It's important for the church of Jesus nationwide. It's important for every church, every Christian. And it's important for me, for us, to embrace this. We're not all called to be the Apostle Paul. We're not all called to do what he did, the great church planting apostle. But we are called to embrace the passion behind this great commission which Paul feels he has. I won't venture to speak of anything except what Christ has done in me. Brothers and sisters, it is all of grace. It is all what Paul was so aware of, which is three times in the Acts of the Apostles, he tells the story of his own conversion, doesn't he? Every time he says, you know, I hated the church, trying to kill them, butchering them, traveling wherever they were to destroy the message, and then God met me on the Damascus Road. So Paul knew that anything he had was clearly grace given because, frankly, he was walking in completely the wrong direction. Members of this congregation will have heard me say in the past that my own story is far less dramatic, but nonetheless significant. I grew up in a Christian home and knelt down by my bedside as a young child, six or seven years of age, I can't quite remember, and asked this Jesus to be special to me in some way. I couldn't hardly articulate the phrase. I was really annoyed by this, as I've told some of you, because when I was a teenager, um, the great stories, particularly from America, of people being saved from drug addiction and the gangland stories. If you're old like me, you'll remember David Wilkerson and the stories of Nicky Cruz and others. Does that mean anything to the old people here? <laughs> yeah, young people just look sort of, you know, interested at this point. Pretend that you know what that old boy is going on about from the front. Um, I was really frustrated because I didn't have any kind of story. And I wanted to be able to stand up in front of congregations and say, you know, I used to sleep around a different woman every night. I was a drunkard, into drugs in a big way, and then converted at the age of seven. Uh, and, uh, you know, it just didn't ring true, really. And so I had to be satisfied with a fairly boring story. But it's a story of grace that's continued through all of my life until now I find myself a man in his very, very, very late 40s uh, who still um, experiences the grace of God. Well, Paul experienced the grace of God in a dramatic conversion story and he never forgot where he'd come from. So humility is a key to all ministry. And then he says, and I've tried to obey God and I've done this in two ways, verse 19, by the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit from Jerusalem all the way around to the Balkans, which is roughly where Illyricum is today, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. So there were two prongs to this church planting, dramatic ministry. One was the power of signs and wonders and the power of the Spirit, that Paul was clearly energized by a force and power beyond his own. And yet there was not just miracle working power, in the ministry of Paul, there was a gospel narrative, the proclamation of some truth. Christianity is undoubtedly experienced without that revelation, without that experience. Christianity seems dull, prosaic, boring. But with only an experience, Christianity is superficial and trivial and not very long lasting as uh, Donald G., one of the early founders of Pentecostalism, said so wisely, all word and no spirit, we dry up. All spirit and no word, we blow up. Word and spirit, we grow up. 
Well, Paul held those two things together in his ministry. And we need to see, uh, uh, I believe, and I long to see more in my own ministry, this combination of spiritual power and articulated gospel truth. The reality that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life and died on the cross and rose from the dead on the third day. And that is not a fable from the first century, a story to entertain children, or even a story that's grasped the imagination of many millions, but a living, breathing reality even today. The church has domesticated these things. We preach the word in our walls, but the gospel sound is largely unheard outside our walls. Our own country is in a dreadful state And so how much we need these two things outside the walls of the church, the proclamation of the good news of Jesus by every means possible into a secular world that doesn't always want to hear it in the West and is very open to it in huge parts of the rest of the world. Not only have we preached in our buildings and not outside them, but we've domesticated the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe that we are really cool, cutting-edge Christians if we have prayer ministry and see people touched or healed in our services. Have you noticed how much of the ministry of Paul took place outside? The key thing in Signs and Wonders in the New Testament is not they took place in the context of a church gathering, but they took place where they were least expected, on the street, in a pagan context. And so it's very easy for us to imagine that the power of the Holy Spirit is something we are interested in in here. But actually, and it's my experience around the world, that God is calling the church to a new faith level. Not a faith level that sees the spirit domesticated, tamed. The Holy Spirit's not some cat to stroke and to enjoy personally in our services. He's a lion to be let loose, roaring in our world. That's what this is about. This release of incredible power and authority. And Paul saw that demonstrated, opening blind eyes healing people who were broken and crippled, confronting darkness at every level. So we need those things in the church. I pray for it in my own ministry, and I pray for it in our ministries and our lives. Spiritual authority combined with articulate presentation of the gospel of Christ. Because Paul said, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. Don't know whether you've thought about the irony of this statement. He's writing to Christians in Rome where he's never been and saying, I want to go. And then saying, I want to go where the gospel hasn't been preached. Well, the gospel's already been preached there. So what Paul's really saying is that part of his broader, wider brief is to gain the support of others. And as he does that, sent out from Antioch, is to take the gospel through Asia Minor in the first of the missionary journeys. Well, the first three, actually. But ultimately, he wants to go to Rome. He's going to go there in a way he doesn't expect, actually. He wants to go and preach in Spain. He wants to travel. He wants to get beyond Asia Minor. God calls him into Europe. The world is where his mission field is. He wants to preach not just to people who need discipling, the people in Rome, but the people who've never heard. One of the thrilling things, I think, that that I've been blessed by in these last 10 years, and I pray will be a a gospel imperative for churches and individual Christians, is that we've got to penetrate areas where the gospel is, at the moment, largely unrealized. And I don't just mean in the unreached people groups in uh, eastern India, or various uh, uh, people groups in Sri Lanka, uh, or various closed countries like North Korea. Of course that's true. Of course the gospel should go there, even though it hasn't penetrated it very much. I'm talking about our own context as well. The context of politics and economics and education. How desperately the gospel is needed there. How we need Pauls to rise up and preach the gospel where it isn't known and heard and wanted. Try speaking gospel realities on the television and see how far you get. Try and affirm some kind of biblical moral framework for sexuality in the media and see how popular you become. How desperately we need it in the political arena. Frankly, the Brexit discussions are an absolute mess. How desperately we need women and men, followers of Jesus, to engage. It's not a simple thing. There isn't a simple answer. But there is a simple gospel that's life transforming. And as it transforms, so it works itself out in all sorts of settings. 
as a church, too often we're talking to ourselves, having conversations, which are good conversations, about a whole range of issues which are of no interest whatever to people out there. We are talking to ourselves far too often. Paul says, I want to go not just to places where the gospel isn't known, but to sectors of society where the gospel isn't known. The Bible's quite clear that Paul got to share in Caesar's household when he got to Rome. No one else got there. To the Sanhedrin. Why did the Sanhedrin listen to Paul with a measure of respect and not with Peter and John, who they called in Greek a grammatoi idiotoi, which means you stupid peasants. Not very tactful, but true. Peter, fisherman. Paul, educated by Gamaliel, got to places others couldn't get. How are we going to break into the world of education, the worlds of medicine with all its moral dilemmas on the edges of life in terms of euthanasia or infanticide or abortion? Who can watch what happened in Ireland recently and not be heartbroken for the life of an innocent, unborn child. Of course, we recognize the complexity of these issues. We fear for the women in Ireland who tragically either lost their lives or were damaged in some way by the way the law is. No one's pre pretending it's a simple solution to all these things. But Christian morality needs to be proclaimed in the hard places where it's not being proclaimed. Simple gospel, complex world. Part of my calling, uh, I think, uh, is to take this message to leaders who've got opportunities to influence others, to shape their agendas, and to give Christians in positions of power confidence. I had the great privilege not so long ago to be speaking in Atlanta and to be speaking to a group of people from around the world. They included a presidential candidate from one of the West Indian islands, the head of thoracic surgery in one of the big Asian countries, the leader uh, of the uh, psychiatric uh, profession in another country, the head of the air force in another country. All these people love Jesus and they're trying to live it out, changing their nation. What an amazing privilege that was. To preach that gospel in that context, encouraging them to know and love the Lord. So the challenge for Paul was not just to go geographically where the gospel wasn't preached, but to find sectors of society where the gospel hadn't made an impact and to embrace those. Caesar's household itself touched with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so I pray, my prayer, and a prayer that you will embrace this prayer is that you will pray to play a part in that and that the church will become an agent of goodness and kindness and transformation in society. You can't watch the news without seeing some of the pain that people are in, in some countries around the world, but here in our own country, the poverty that still exists, the sadness of broken families, the emptiness of things. We have a, a very, very strong and clear message in a world which is becoming increasingly trivialized. Uh, I, I find it, uh, I can't tell you how frustrated I am with the media. Okay, I'm very frustrated with the media. I am telling you that. Okay. Okay. You don't have to look at the, the, the 20 stories that are the front pages of Sky News or BBC or CNN. Do you know what the number one hit on any news website this weekend was about? Love Island. You're obviously not big fans of Love Island. Well, it's basically soft porn for the 21st century. But it's massively influential. But where was the mention this weekend of the people still being butchered in Yemen? Or the Somali crisis that never goes away? or Christians and others in South Sudan who live daily in fear of their lives. We live in a world where the media has become a source of entertainment, not a source of education. And the church has got to rise up and address these big questions because, to use Neil Postman's great phrase, we are amusing ourselves to death. And the big issues of the day are simply not being raised with a loud enough clarion call to say these things matter, humans are suffering. And ultimately, the answer does lie in economic empowerment. Ultimately, the answer does lie in compassion and clean water and good housing. 
But unless those things are wrapped around with spiritual reformation and renewal, they will be not long-lasting. So we need to see women and men born all over again in order to see societies touched and transformed. So we thank God for Christians involved in food banks. We thank God for Christians involved as street pastors. These things are great societal engagements. Wonderful. Let's make sure that as a church, we engage in the spreading of the unique message we have, which is in a God-man who lived and died to grant human forgiveness, new life, and a different way of being a society, genuinely loving one another. Amen.